All right, welcome back everyone to this series of videos on writing a game in vanilla JavaScript. So we've come a long way in the previous episodes. We started by rendering our hero on the screen and we used a tile system to make a map for the player to explore. Then we added collision detection so our player would stop walking through the walls. And finally, in the last episode, we added animation to the game. But our game world is very empty. There's nothing for the player to interact with. So it's time to fill our game up with, you know, stuff, monsters and items, and other things that the player can interact with. Let's think about how we would do this from a coding perspective. So we have a bunch of different types of things. Let's call them entities. What's an entity? Well, basically anything in the game. The hero, that's an entity. Uh, different types of monsters, their entities, uh, anything the player can collect. For example, uh, let's say we have these crystals you can collect for points or mushrooms you can collect for health. They're entities. So we have all these entities and they share some common properties and behavior. Uh, like for example, they can all be like drawn on the screen animated. Uh, the monsters and the hero, they can move around. They need some like collision detection code. But you also have some things that are unique to certain types of entities. For example, uh, only the hero can be moved by the player using the keyboard. Uh, only the crystal gives you points if you pick it up, etc. So it seems like we have a classic software engineering problem here, right? We want to share some behavior and code between certain types of entities. Uh, for example, the collision detection code. But on the other hand, we have some behavior that's specific to certain types of entities. Uh, for example, you know, only the hero needs the you know, keyboard control code. So how would you usually do this? Well, the classic object-oriented programming answer would probably be something like some kind of class hierarchy. So we create an abstract entity class. JavaScript doesn't really have abstract classes, not vanilla JavaScript, but you know, we can just call it abstract and everyone knows what you mean. People know you're not supposed to instantiate it. So we do that. And then in that abstract entity class, we could put all the common state and behavior uh, that all or at least lots of the entities need. Then we would extend the class with concrete classes for the actual different entity types. And that's where you can put specific behavior. So just the hero, for instance, would have the you know, keyboard control code. So that sounds good. And actually, I think this is not an unreasonable way to do things. But you might say, well, wait a second. Uh, the bat monster and the slime monster are both monsters. They both have AI control, right? So maybe we'll create an abstract monster class. And OK, that's a fair enough thing to do. That's still fine. But then you might go, actually, I want to add another type of monster. I want to add a squid monster. So you think, well, like a squid is like, squid is kind of like a bat, but like underwater, right? So we'll just extend the bat and we'll make the squid monster. And now you're extending or subclassing a concrete class. And I think that's a very treacherous path to go down. Because what happens is after a while you end up with something like this. You have a really deep, uh, complicated inheritance tree. And this becomes a real pain to work with for lots of reasons. Uh, there are a lot of people, you know, it's 2025. A lot of people know all the problems of this. But anyway, let me let me let me elucidate for a little bit. So, for example, sooner or later, you want to change the behavior of class in the middle of this hierarchy, but you don't necessarily want to change the behavior of the classes below. Uh, and now you have to do something hacky, or you have to go and rearrange the class hierarchy, which is a pain. And there are other problems, right? Like it's hard to understand. Like, for example, if you're a class all the way down here, to understand how this class really works, you actually have to understand, you have to read the code of all these classes above it and think about how it all interacts because subclassing, you know, breaks encapsulation and all that. Um, and it's not very composable, right? Like it assumes all the entities fit nicely into this hierarchy where everything has a single parent, but maybe that's not really the right way to model the type of you know, entities that we have, right? Maybe you want something more flexible where you can take, you know, bits and pieces of, of behavior and state uh, from different places and you want to meld them together into a new entity that wouldn't fit nicely into the, uh, you know, this, this hierarchy that you've created. So these days, everyone agrees that in most cases, this is not actually a nice way of doing things. Uh, nevertheless, I see a lot of code like this 
in production. But anyway, I digress. So what are the alternatives? Well, we could be disciplined and decide we'll only ever have one level of inheritance, one level of subclassing. And we'll try to use things like, for example, the type object pattern for code reuse. And I think this is pretty good. This is a pretty good way of doing things. And if you want to do things that, that way, that's great. Uh, but while I was researching this problem, um, I came across a totally different solution that I think is very, very cool. Uh, so that's what this video is going to be about. And that solution is called the Entity Component System Pattern. So what is the Entity Component System Pattern? Well, it basically says we should ignore all the traditional OO thinking about encapsulation and subclassing and all that kind of stuff. And we should do things in a totally different way. Before I explain exactly how it works, I want to say a little about the motivation behind this pattern. So the first thing to note is that the people that came up with this pattern, uh, which was people who were making games in languages like C++ back in the late 90s, they were very concerned about performance and scalability. Since I'm just making a little game in JavaScript, I'm not going to focus on those particular aspects in this video, but it's something to be aware of. The other cool thing we get out of this pattern is really amazing flexibility and composability with our entities. And I'll show some examples of this at the end of the video. All right, so enough of that. What is the entity component system pattern? Let's start with the entities. Basically, everything is an entity. The hero, they're an entity. The monsters, each one of them is an entity. Crystals you can pick up, each one of them is an entity. Same thing for the mushrooms uh, that you can pick up to get health, each one of them is an entity. But each entity is really just an ID, that's all. And what we're going to do is we, we are going to associate each of these entities uh, with what we call components. And a component is just a, essentially it's just some data. It doesn't contain any logic, just data. So you can see that every entity has a position, for example. So they all get a position component. And every entity gets a bounding box component as well that we're going to use for collision detection. But say only the entities that can move, they might get a velocity component. And only some entities get a health component or an animation component uh, with animation data for the entity, etc. Only the hero can be controlled by the keyboard. So only they get a keyboard controls component. Remember, these components are just data. The keyboard controls component, it just maps keys to actions. It doesn't have any logic in it. We'll get to the logic in a minute. And maybe we have, for example, an AI strategy component. That's just for the monsters. Or maybe we have a points component. That's just for the crystals, since you get points for picking up the crystal, et cetera, et cetera. There are lots of different types of components that we can use. So we have all our data, our entities, and their associated components. Where does the actual logic go? So this is where the systems come in. We create a bunch of systems, and each system is only interested in entities that have certain components. For example, we might have a movement system, and that only cares about entities that have a velocity and position component. The animation system only cares about entities that have an animation component. The health system only cares about entities with a health component, etc., etc. Before we render each frame, each system will iterate through the entire list of entities and pick out the ones it cares about based on the components that each entity is associated with. It will then do whatever it wants with the entity and the components. It might just perform a side effect. For example, the animation system will perform the side effect of drawing the entity on the canvas using the data from the entity's animation component. Or it might update the entity by updating the entity's components. For example, the keyboard input system will update the velocity and other components for an entity based on the user's keyboard input. So we arrange these systems into a stack. And each system is run in turn, each iterating through all the entities once per frame. And that's it, really. Note that the order of the systems is important here. E.g. the keyboard input system and the monster AI system need to run before the movement system. OK, so does it work? Well, let's take a look at the results first, then we can run through the code. So here is the game running, but now with everything moved into the entity component system pattern. And you can see all the existing work we did movement, collision detection, animation, etc. It's working. Note now we also have some monsters in our game. We have this slime monster, which is not very smart. It just moves in random directions. We can fight it with our sword using the new combat system that I've added. And we also have these bat monsters. They will try to attack you when you get close to them, but you can outrun them and try to defeat them one at a time. 
if we look at the console, we can see that we are logging some information about the way entities are interacting. Note you can get health by picking up the mushrooms, and you get points for collecting the crystals. If you die, the game keeps on going without you, which is kind of cool. Let's do a quick tour of the code to see how it works. First, we have the entity class. As you can see, this is a very simple class. It just takes an ID in the constructor, and it holds a list of components. The rest is just a few convenience methods for dealing with the components. That's it. Next, let's head on over to the entity content system class. It's also very simple. It holds a list of entities and a list of systems. Here we have the method to create a new entity. We take the given name and append the counter next entity ID to make sure each entity has a unique ID. Then we push it onto the list of entities. Similarly, there is a method to add new systems to the ECS. Note that we have the update method. This is called once per frame in the request animation frame handler. As you can see, it simply calls each system in turn, passing in a list of entities, as well as the delta time. Delta time, as discussed in previous episodes, is used for timing of movement, animations, and other things. Finally, there is also this cleanup entities method that we call at the end of update. This cleans up any entities that have died and need to be removed from the game. How about the components? Well, they live in components.js. Each component is a class that holds some data, and that's it. I ended up with 13 different component classes. I may have gone a little overboard here, but keeping the components fine-grained like this gives us maximum flexibility. And now for the stars of the show, the systems. We have an abstract system class that all systems inherit from, using the template method pattern. I know I was ragging on inheritance before, but I think the template method pattern is a legit use case for inheritance. Anyway, each system registers the components it's interested in by putting them in the required components array. In the update method, we filter the entities for the ones that have the required components before calling the update for entity method for each matching entity. Note that we also have this before method. Some systems need to get a handle on other entities that they need to know about, for example, for doing collision detection. And this method allows them to do this. I ended up with eight different systems for the game. They are the keyboard control system, the AI control system, the movement system, the animation system, the static image system, the combat system, the collectible system, and the health system. Many of these systems contain logic that used to live in the hero class, which no longer exists. Let's take a look at the static image system, since it's a simple example. This is a system for entities that are not animated and render only as a single static image. In the constructor, we can see that the static image system registers that is interested only in those entities that have a position and a static image component by setting the required components variable. Then in the update for entity method, it extracts these components from the entity and uses them to draw the image onto the canvas. In the game.js file, we create a new ECS called world and add all the systems to it, being careful to consider the order we want the systems to run in. And then inside of our request animation frame callback, we call world.update, which will update the ECS once per frame. But how do we create the entities? The entities are all stored in the level data. Each entity just has a type and an XY position for now. The types are registered in the file called entity templates.js. Each template, as I call it, creates a new entity for the given type. E.g. here we see the player template. We create a bunch of components for the player, action, position, bounding box, keyboard controls, etc. Then we create a new entity in the ECS and add the components to it. That's it. For comparison, here is the template for the bat. So you might say, this looks like a lot of work. Is it really worth it? Well, first off, I like this way of thinking about things in terms of systems and components instead of classes. It makes a lot of sense to me. And secondly, the flexibility you give with this system is really cool. Allow me to demonstrate. Let's say you want to create a new monster for the game. Let's say a bigger bat, but also the bat heals you instead of fighting you. With the ECS, this is fairly trivial. We just take the existing bat animations and tweak them to make the display size bigger. Now we create a new bat template. Let's call it big bat. We tweak a few params like the bounding box and of course configure it to use the big bat animation. Now we remove the combat component 
so the big bat won't be a fighter anymore. And we add a collectible component, which makes the big bat an object you can collect to get points and health. Now we just go into the map data and add a big bat. And let's try it out. There is our big bat. And when we touch it, we get some health. I think this is super cool. There are many other fun things we can make. For instance, if I add an AI component to the crystals, I can make them move towards the player like the bats do. And here is a really cool example. Let's say I want to make the game a two-player game. I can just go and create a new keyboard's controls component and assign some new keyboard mappings. Let's say WSAD for movement and shift for attack. Then I create a template called player2, assign a new keyboard controls component to it, and add a player2 entity into the level data. And bam, now it's a two-player game. This is really cool, and I didn't have to change any logic or create any new classes. I just play around with the game data. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that the entity component system pattern is pretty cool. I really enjoy working with this pattern. It makes a lot more sense to me than the traditional object-oriented approach. Anyway, I'm going to keep playing around with these game entities. As always, check out the code on GitHub, and don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss the next video.